Hello, I'm John Butt. Uh, I'm a professor of music here in Glasgow at the University. Um, I'm also a conductor and organist uh, and harpsichordist, so uh, I do quite a few things in that performance world, but I also work in the world of musicology. So many of the things I'll talk about here, and as I've discovered here, relate to both those worlds for me. The first thing I've pulled out is uh, Mozart's Mass in C minor in the completion of Richard Maunder. Uh, I've conducted this at least twice this year. Um, and I've also examined a PhD in Amsterdam, uh, which involved a new edition of this piece, which I'm hoping to perform, if not record, soon. C minor Mass of Mozart, I think, sums up so many interesting things about the 18th century, um, not just Mozart's own sound world, but also his looking back to uh, the periods before him, the tradition of mass writing and so on. And it's a piece of music that really fascinates me, not least because it's unfinished. We just have the Kyrie Gloria and then bits of the Credo and, and Sanctus. Um, but wonderful piece. I mean, it, it's one of those pieces that, that points to what Mozart might have been doing had he lived a few more years, because uh, he was going into much more church music uh, in the last year of his life. Um, and Mozart is always a fascinating composer because he sort of straddles the sacred and the secular in the 18th century and, and sort of points to the way music involved some sort of symbiosis between those two in the coming century. Oh, some bottles. Uh, um, uh, bringing the sacred and secular together so that in some ways it all becomes one art uh, which sort of points beyond human ideas without a particular religious dogma. So I think Mozart is very much part of that process in Western culture. And the C minor mass is a piece that, if you don't know it already, is, is well worth listening to and studying uh, in the various versions that complete the latter movements as well, because uh, there's some interesting surprises in some of those editions. So wonderful piece. Um, my discovery of the year, or perhaps rediscovery of the year, because I used to play it a lot when I was a viola player in my teens, is Symphony Number no. 8 of Schubert, The Unfinished. I had to conduct this at two days' notice a few months ago with the SCO, somebody was ill, so there I was, I said I'd do it, because we're also doing the C minor mass of Mozart, which I knew much better. Uh, so it was wonderful to revisit the symphony, uh, uh, the unfinished symphony. Um, absolutely unbelievable piece. Um, what I didn't know much about it before studying it this time was that in fact nobody really knew it in the outside world till around about 1860. So it really speaks to a much later generation than Schubert's. And everything about it is extraordinary. The shape of the phrases, the modulations, the chords, the luminous orchestration, uh, the ambiguity of its mood. It's, it, 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 it sort of really points, I think, to that early modern period at the end of the 19th century when one is sort of looking at what the possibilities are uh, for what we might call our, our our modern age and Schubert's eighth I think really does that in a in a in a really eerie sort of way um, so that was a fantastic discover well rediscovery for me to study that in such detail for two days and then conduct it twice How did uh, it, go? Hmm? How did it, go? it went very well yes yeah no, I was quite impressed um, I mean obviously I, I listened to lots of recordings uh, of various people suddenly you know just just to compare them and um, it was quite interesting what I immediately um, found interesting what I didn't find interesting in in a lot of previous in fact a lot of previous recordings virtually all of them I found rather sort of stodgy and formal as if this is such a, a mainstream piece that you uh, you know you don't need to do much to it but actually uh, it's so extraordinary if you come to it afresh, like I did, after about 20 years of not of barely hearing it. Um, I felt that it, that, it, that it was really more extraordinary than, than most people do, and hopefully that came out somewhat in the concert. Uh, next, I have a Bruckner Symphony. This is number four. Uh, you might think Bruckner is a stodgy composer. Uh, m many people do. Uh, and that if you actually look at the score of Bruckner, it does look quite sort of 
formal and formalized with you know there's a block of wind there's a block of strings and so on but there's something about this music which actually is not unlike that of Schubert in his unfinished mood um this sort of chiseled um slightly modal sound uh that goes slightly against the norms of tonality and also pushes uh well in Buchner's case in particular pushes into lots and lots of different keys and something I think he did get directly from Schubert and, and indeed Mozart too so in fact Mozart Mozart, Schubert, Buchner, they sort of go together in a funny sort of way. Um, in fact, my one contribution to the London Proms this year is to give a lecture on Buchner's Fifth Symphony, which is my favourite symphony, um, a piece that's not very well known, even within Buchner's um, devotees, modern devotees. Uh, it's a piece that I, I find quite extraordinary because it's so retrospective in many respects. It starts like a Trier sonata uh, and then it sort of goes into almost like a Stravinsky and fanfare. Then it goes into a romantic symphony that almost seems as if it started ten minutes earlier but we missed the beginning of it. So there's something very, very striking and, and almost rupturing about it um, that is obviously very reminiscent of Mahler putting different types of music next to one another. With Mahler, it's fantastic. I mean, I would, I'd be the last person to say that Mahler is a poor composer. But there's something about Buchner, I think it's possibly the religious side of Buchner and his very, very conservative background and demeanour that makes the music actually very radical. And to my mind, is, is some of the most radical music, sort of accidentally radical, I think. Uh, really exciting. Then um, some Debussy, it's Debussy year, Nocturne. Um, I couldn't find La Mer, which is my favourite non-symphony. So if you think of Buchner V was my favourite symphony, uh, La Mer is my favourite non-symphony, which is symphonic sketches it's called. Nocturne though, almost, almost as good. Uh, Debussy has always been a great inspiration to me. Um, just, I think, because of the way he understands how uh, orchestration and placing of instruments actually has a sort of harmonic, tonal sound uh, and this is something I think which is endemic to the French tradition I conduct quite a lot of French Baroque music I was doing some Rameau just a week ago and this it's almost as if there's a tradition that you can sort of trace back to Rameau and actually people before him too but particularly Rameau going through Berlioz going through to Debussy and Ravel uh, where it's not just a question of orchestration being something you slap onto notes that are already written but where the orchestration actually is part of the sound world of the music and gives it a, an extra sort of element of harmonic colour uh, and the Nocturne in, in particular and, and uh, La Mer do that so well very worthwhile celebrating in um, the year of Debussy's um, centenary centenary of his death uh, César Franck, um, most people would think of César Franck as a, as a good B composer, C composer perhaps, uh, but certainly not a D composer, uh, as it were, although he is decomposing. Um, but the uh, thing about César Franck, again, is the same issue. It's to do with colour um, and understanding um, the way the, the, the chords are put together, the way the instrumentation is done. Um, and as an organist, I've always played bits of César Franck um, with some degree of success. I, I always like César Franck's music. But recently, I bought the new Hauptwerk organ system, uh, which is in, essentially a system by which, with a computer, you can duplicate the sounds of any organ that's been recorded pipe by pipe um, and then have it, as it were, as an organ in your house. Uh, so it's as good as a CD of the original organ, essentially. Uh, so I uh, have bought a French organ as one of my several organs, uh, a French romantic organ, the Cavaico, very similar to what uh, Frank used for his organ music. And believe me, this music, I've got the Prelude Fugan variation here, uh, his most famous organ music, perhaps. Um, when you hear it on that original organ uh, sound of the Cavaico, um, it actually he becomes an A-grade composer. You can sort of hear how he's actually judged the quality of the chords, the sounds, uh, to fit the instrument, but also to capitalise on the incredible resonance that you get from all the various registers, which you can't duplicate directly on a non-French organ. So, in other words, the instrument is a crucial part of a composition. Uh, and then to end with, uh, I've got Messiaen's uh, Du Parmino, du Parmino uh, from La Nativité, which I played first as a teenager and have continued to play ever since. Uh, very inspiring sound. You could almost say that um, 
uh, Messiaen is the uh, successor to Debussy in some respects, or uh, to, to Stravinsky too in some other respects too. Uh, whatever you think about Messiaen, perhaps he, write, he wrote too much music, I think, sometimes, uh, but at his best, a stunning composer, and also somebody who really capitalised on the uh, sound world of the French romantic organ, uh, but also, of course, the orchestra. You think of the Tarangalila Symphony, unbelievable colours that, that are not just colours, they are actually the music, the structure of the music, the structure of the chords. Uh, he was said to have uh, had synesthesia. Um, I, I don't ever take anything Messian ever said that seriously, but I think, yes, he, he certainly had an unbelievable oral imagination that uh, really related to everything else in his life, his his perception of colour, his perception of time, and also his religion, which is, again, a sort of very naive but colourful uh, aspect of his life, which dominates so much of his music, but in a way that, that I think all of us can appreciate. Mm-hmm. 